Edmonton will have its third LRT line, which is the Valley Line. It's already got the map here, but it says future service. And I would definitely have to come back to the city once the Valley Line is in operation so that I can redo this challenge. This video is about the Valley Line Southeast from an urban planning, urban design, connectivity and accessibility perspective. If you were expecting another every station in three hour or less video, unfortunately, and my apologies, I'm not doing it again this time. A lot of YouTubers and content creators have done it in the early days following the opening of the line back in November 2023. But if this video can make it to 50,000 views, which I bet it never will, I'll do that again, including the Valley Line, the Metro Line, and the Capital Line. This line is divided into two phases, with phase one, aka the phase that we're talking about for this video, being called the Valley Line Southeast. It is a 13 km stretch from Millwoods to downtown at 102nd Street, while phase two, called the Valley Line West, is still being constructed to expand all the way from downtown to Lewis Farms, hoping to open in 2027. Prior to the opening of the line, two express bus routes were operated at high frequency as a way of getting citizens familiarized with the routes that the train will pass through. This is a great way of introducing our soft launching and new services to attract more transit riders. And I've talked about this in a past video. These routes, however, ceased their operation in February as the Valley Line definitely has a much higher carrying capacity than both of them and was confirmed a decent five minute headway on weekdays. Valley Line trains are low floor LRT, which is a fancy word for streetcar or trams in my opinion. The tracks also look like streetcar tracks, so a lot of standards for streetcars can be applied to it. The trains in operation are Bombardier's Flexibility, whose family have both streetcars and light rail models. Since it operates like a streetcar, its speed and standard do follow what a streetcar looks like. And I strongly recommend that you find out more about low floor LRT and tram vehicles in other cities or countries. Furthermore, it cannot and does not operate as fast as a train or subway or even the high floor LRT that Edmontons currently have, but it can still be faster than rows of cars in traffic and having its own right of way or priority signal especially during rush hours. I had a little tour of the interior of the train and it does remind me of some European train models with blue seats and a narrow body, well at least narrower than the Capital and Metro Line trains. There is a dedicated area for bikes and there's also a TV screen showing the upcoming three stops, not just one stop by one. This screen sometimes also displays digital art as well. The accessible seats are equipped with green painted fabric. At first, I did not know how accessible they are given that there is a step. However, these seats are in areas without a step, allowing people to not have to step up and down to sit down. These trains can be coupled together for improved capacity or run as a single train. The stations are all designed to fit two car trains, but you can come across both one car and two car trains at all times of the day. Want to know if your train is two car or one car? Just look at the display at the station. Valley Line trains are also equipped with completely different audible signals compared to the existing high floor LRTs. This is a Valley Line train to Melbourne. Next stop, Churchill Connected. This is a Valley Line train. Please transfer at the Churchill Connected to the Churchill Station for a Capital or a Metro Line train. The door announced a loud beep when they are available to open to accommodate visually impaired passengers. <laughs> and a very familiar melody when they close. That's the analysis of the new train. Now come to the overview of the stations. Each station has some heated shelters, one or two ticket machines, and several scanners. Some can be opened by pressing a button, but I'm not sure how the heat can be activated. From Taproot, there have been some records of some heated shelters not working. I hope that this issue can be fixed soon. The station also features dashboards displaying when the train arrives, contact information, and the date and time of the day. Many shelters also feature public arts and indigenous art as well. The yellow tactile strips are available across the platforms. And in this context of the line being a low floor train with lower platforms, this is the correct indication of a curb approaching. The stations also feature audible signals announcing when the train arrives and bike parking racks despite some facing space constraints, which is highly appreciated.
Let's start with the first station of the line, Millwoods. Located close to Millwoods Town Center, the station serves as an immediate interchange to the Millwoods Transit Center with some cross-town routes and bus routes going to the southeast neighborhoods of the city. This station is a solid 5-minute walk to the front door of Millwoods, and it can involve some more walking connections to the bus station. On a side note, Millwoods Transit Center has public washrooms, which is rare when it comes to agencies that are providing this service to people. Surrounding the stop are some other commercial businesses and a coffee shop, which are great trip generators for this station. Millwoods is also home to the Pride Walkway, which was a community-based project to include public art and increase safety in the area. However, this path does not directly link up with the platform, and you still have to walk in a U-shape to reach it. Moving on to the next station, we hit Grey Nuns. This station is parallel to 66th Street by Tawa Center and the Grey Nuns Hospital. It looks like Edmonton Transit is working towards covering all their hospitals with access to rapid transit, when all hospitals are having or will have nearby rapid transit coverage. Royal Alexandra and University Hospitals are covered by the Metro Line, Northeast Community Health Center by the Cabral Line, Grey Nuns Hospital by the Valley Line Southeast, and soon the Misericordia Hospital by the Valley Line West. I really admire the public art at this station. They create a more welcoming and artistic vibe to it. There is also a pathway running parallel with the tracks to connect with the nearby neighborhoods. This pathway is not connected to the platform of the station, like the next station, Milbourne Woodvale. It's another station parallel to 66th Street Northwest. The station is surrounded by residential development, so the current ridership is slow as I don't often see people boarding or waiting at this station often. The exit signs of all Valley Line train stations will list the street it is leading to on top and the neighborhoods or attraction points at the bottom. One pet peeve of running parallel to the street is, while the Valley Line tracks here have a speed limit of 55 km an hour, vehicles can drive at a maximum speed of 60 km an hour. We cannot increase the track speed of the train for safety reasons, but we can reduce the speed of the road to make it safer and approachable to non-automobile commuters. This pathway can be very close to the track at some point, which makes it super loud when a train passes by. However, the closer you are to the station, more natural barriers like plants or rocks replace those steel fences. I also found that the pedestrian lights here are thick boxes and I'm curious what prompted this design. The next station is Davies. After passing through the Millwoods Golf Course and the new Gary White Garage for Valley Line trains, there are some new pathways running parallel with the tracks on 75th Street between McIntyre Road and 51st Avenue, which are great train spotting locations, but some segments can be very close to the track. The station is an elevated after an elevated pillar across 75th Street. Davies is a park and ride station, yet it has a seamless connection to the buses right on the first floor, which is where park and ride transit can work, since pedestrians don't have to walk too far for a transfer. This park and ride station also has several exits to the streets to access nearby industrial areas. The total number of park and ride here is 1300. Some of these parking lots are under review for potential transit-oriented development, so they can be within the best catchment area for the station. Davies Station has two floors, but two levels of escalators, as the construction wants to ensure that there are heat retention for the shelter due to the platforms not having heaters, and the roofs do shelter some cold air in. Davies Station also has a convenience store that opens on weekdays. Did you know, in the original plan for the Valley Line, this station was named Wagner? The reason for the name change is to demonstrate the wide catchment area of the station, which is Davies Industrial, instead of just naming it after Wagner Road. The train now goes through some curvy elevated tracks and descends to street level at 83rd Street. The next stop is Avonmore, a street level station with both platforms located on the far side of the intersection. This station is also in the median of the street, but since it's small enough, crossing here is not a big deal compared to the bigger stations like Southgate or Century Park. Avonmore station was also renamed during the planning process from 73rd Avenue, again to demonstrate the catchment area to be the entire neighborhood. Since the train runs at street level here, it still has to follow traffic signals at junctions, resulting in some potential stops. The next station is Bonnie Dune, located at the vibrant White Avenue, or 82nd Avenue, and 83rd Street. The primary connection that this station aimed for is possibly the Bonnie Dune Center, but its catchment area also includes the Makami College, the Ottawa Library, and the Bonnie Dune Leisure Center. 
since it is a roadside stop on the west side of 83rd Street. Valley Line crosses the traffic flow twice to reach it. If you go onto Google Street View, you can also see the transformation of 83rd Street over time, before the tracks were built and after it. I'm not sure about other stations, but Bonnie Dune has a really charming audible signals for pedestrians. Bonnie Dune Station is also the connection hub for regional transit services, where Strathcona County buses take people to Orts. It also provides connection for university students to get to University of Alberta, utilizing the high frequency Route 4 running down White Avenue. Holly Route Station is next, also a roadside station, but they're on the east side of 85th Street. The platforms are on the near side of the intersection this time. The houses nearby are mostly small scale residential buildings, but they can be up to three stories in height and multi-unit homes can be developed. This way, the density is gently built to support the ridership of the line. What is interesting about this area are the back alleys being treated as shortcut paths for pedestrians, which allow easier access to the station. There is a construction for a medium density apartment complex that is underway here. Strathern Station is next. The station is a median station again, with one lane in each direction to cross. Close to the station is the Strathern Community League building, which is like a community center where people can come together and build community through different activities. These locations are becoming more rare in many cities, but I'm glad to see that a big city like Edmonton still has them. The train now goes parallel with the curve of Connors Road to approach Muttard Station. This is by far the nicest view of the line, in my opinion, where you can see the homes under the hill as the train climbs up going southeast and descends going west. You can also see the Tawatana Bridge in the distance and the tall buildings north of the river in downtown. I'm still not sure if it's pronounced Matard or Mutard. Since the train announcement and the video from City of Edmonton 11 years ago pronounced it differently. Next stop, Mutard. Next stops, Mutard, Quarters, Churchill, and Center West. The station has a direct access to the Matard Conservatory which is an excellent example of providing transit access to a tourist destination for entertainment purposes. But if you walk past the conservatory's back door using the pedestrian path in the beautiful Gallinger Park, you will come across some residential development also within the walking distance to the station. The pedestrian pathways also take you to the Edmonton Ski Club, the River Valley Trail Network, and the Mill Creek Ravine nearby. Now the train follows a sharp curve that you will hear some screeching sounds of the wheels to get to the Tawatana Bridge, which means valley in Plains Cree. The bridge is a double deck bridge, where the upper deck is for the trains and the lower deck features some multi-use pathways for bikes and pedestrians. The upper deck has started the train testing progress since 2022, while the lower deck was open to the public in 2021. The bridge also features some indigenous arts on the ceiling of the lower deck. Southeast of the bridge is the Accidental Beach. As the name suggests, it is accidentally created during the construction of the bridge, where the sand and soil deposited into the riverbank to form the beach accidentally. Now the train enters the tunnel where it can get to its top speed of 65 km an hour. This tunnel then makes a turn onto 102nd Avenue, thus explaining the screeching sound while inside it. The next station is Quarters, I'm not sure if the station is a part of Chinatown, but there are some Chinese-owned business nearby, as well as the Chinese style gate at the entrance to the tunnel. The Chinese Senior Association and Choir Society is also nearby. Close to the station is 96th Street, which underwent a mass transformation process to make it more people-friendly, with trees, promenades, and brick surface. The speed limit is 20 km an hour here, and it allows cars, bikes, and pedestrians to share the street together. There are many parking lots in this area, and hopefully they can be utilized to build productive urban structures in the future, like this Kinistina Park, one block away, which means us three in Plains Cree. The next station is Churchill, or Churchill Connector. The station is located directly south of Churchill Square and the City Hall, with underground access to the Capitol and Metro Line trains, the downtown library nearby, and multiple attractions like the City Center Mall or the Citadel Theater. From Churchill Square, you can also see the most impressive public art, aka this message. Speaking of arts, the Edmonton Arts Council is right by the station, inside the square. Did you know that the downtown library is nicknamed Bibliotank because it's shaped like a tank? And lastly, 
The last station of the Valley Line Southeast is 102nd Street Station. I can call it the temporary terminus of the Valley Line for now because it would keep going westward. The station is next to a contraflow bike lane and a cobblestone street for cars, which would naturally help keep them running at a slow speed. Interestingly, the closest bus stop connecting passengers to this stop is the stop by 101 Street and Jasper Avenue, close to Central LRT Station. From 102nd Street Station, if you're not in the mood of waiting for a train, you can just walk to Churchill, as the distance between these two stations are the shortest in the line at only 310 meters. I've just guided you through the current Valley Line Southeast. Now let's take a quick look at what's happening at the west of 102nd Street. If you go to the West Edmonton Mall, you can see the viaduct and the current WEM station being constructed. This viaduct keeps going towards Misericordia Station, which is also under construction. If you take any bus route going on 87 Avenue, you can see the ongoing construction happening. Further west, the overpass above Anthony Hende Drive to connect to the future Lewis Farm Depot was also finished recently. I know that this is a very brief update, so I promise you that there will be a dedicated video on the status of the future Valley Line West in the future. Thanks for watching this whole video and I hope to see you in the future. I'd like to thank all my supporters who support me via my Buy Me A Coffee page. If you'd like to see your names at the end of the video, check out the donation links in the bio. I appreciate any amount that you chip in as making these videos require a lot of efforts, research, and also money for articles and books but you helped maintain my motivation. See you in the next videos.